Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Colby Charpentier's Artist in Resident presentation. I'm Nathan Stanfield. I'm the ceramic studio manager at the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Southern California. Amoka champions the art, history, creation, and technology of ceramics through exhibitions, collections, outreach, and studio programming. Today's artist talk focuses on the work of Colby Charpentier, who has been in residence at Amoka Studios since September of 2021. AMOCA's Artist in Resident program, established in 2012, is one of the few long-term fellowship opportunities for ceramic artists on the West Coast. This residency provides artists an opportunity to produce or develop a new body of work. The program is funded through generous support from Julianne and David Armstrong, Laguna Clay, and the Wingate Foundation. The next call for residency applications will be January 2023. Uh, today, Colby will be sharing some of his work and experiments during his time as artist in residence at AMOCA. Also joining us today is AMOCA's Executive Director, Beth Ann Gerstein, who has been instrumental in supporting and champion, championing ceramic artists and growing our artist in resident program. Our Associate Director of Communications and Stewardship, Genevieve Kaplan, is also here. She'll be monitoring Zoom logistics and chat during this talk. Now I'm excited to introduce Colby, one of our resident artists who came to Amoka last fall and is now in the final weeks of his residency. Uh, oh, well, I'm gonna give a little bio. <laughs> uh, Colby Charpentier received his MFA from the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomingfield Hills uh, and his BFA from Alfred University in Alfred, New York. He has served as a resident artist at the Morian Center for Clay in St. Petersburg, Florida. Sonoma Ceramics in Sonoma, California, Goggle Works Center for the Arts and Reading, Pennsylvania, and Harvard's Ceramic Program, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Charpentier has taught at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and the Harvard Ceramics Program and has been a recipient of numerous awards. Char uh, Colby Charpentier is the resident at AMOCA for September to August, 2022. Uh, before Colby starts his presentation, I want to remind everyone this talk is being recorded and to please mute yourself. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers uh, after the presentation, and I will now turn the presentation over to Colby. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Get our screen share up. That's great. All right. Ooh. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Nathan. And um, we'll get rolling here and just bear with me because this is a totally new talk. Um, we've got 189 slides of stuff from just this year. Um, so yeah, let's let's get rolling. All right. Um, as far as my practice goes, uh, there's sort of a, a research end and a making end. And when I came into this residency, I always sort of formulate a residency plan. Um, and this kind of one morsel um, is essentially the residency plan. Um, and this is a, essentially it's little uh, segments of brick. Um, so brick like you would get at Home Depot, uh, cut up on a, a tile saw and assembled with glaze. And when I came into this residency, I knew that I would approach this. Um, so day one was just arriving and, and sort of getting into pots and starting to build that momentum. Um, but then from there, it was starting to test clays. Uh, one of the great things about the residency here is that um, Laguna hooks up all the residents with materials. Um, and so the first order of business was just getting all the clays to test. Um, and then really go through and start to figure out what can happen from there. Um, one of the, the sort of early problems was just figuring out how to get these little segments to start to take on more shapes and do more things. So it's, it's starting really tiny and just starting to figure out how do I arrange these or how do I make these become something. Um, and as well as figuring out like what the work is, it's also just figuring out like what the, the materials are. 
And as this is going on, it's just your brain is sort of active as you're moving through everything. And so what I'm trying to do is just sort of pay attention uh, because there's all these little moments. I mean, that this slide here is really just, these, these are cut marks from slicing up all the clay. And I don't really have an answer for how that becomes work at the moment in terms of formalizing it into a, an object, but it'll, it'll probably come up down the road. And this is one of the neat things. Um, so this Ulfa cutter has been with me since 2009 from, from undergrad. Um, and it's been through a lot. Um, so, and again, this is just more of, of sort of the cutting and the paying attention. And I, I think so, some of what I'm interested in is just finding a starting point for clay that's different than what we, what we expect. Um, it's easy to sort of show up to clay and, and just have the clay out of the bag and, and maybe place it on the wheel and, and do the thing. Um, but I, I have a really short attention span. And so I want to constantly be churning through and just finding new ways of considering the material. Um, so that previous pile, I mean, these are all just the cutoffs. Um, and th this here is just trying to find ways to resolve, you know, what that is um, and, and what that can become. Uh, th these are actually tile samples. So all those little bits are then assembled onto the commercial tile. And when they're fired, the glaze goes up and grabs that material, and then it becomes its own sort of unit. Um, and this is just another example of being able to take objects. Um, a lot of times, these are sort of on a maquette scale. Um, but being able to take those objects and just assemble them into something. And that, that act of assembly is sort of what makes them become an object. Um, and all this while, just sort of testing, um, I guess one of the obvious things working with brick-like materials is to start to move towards a mortar. Um, but what I found really interesting is that refractory mortar is something that can be fired again. Um, so instead of going through the process of firing the ceramic material and then, you know, essentially just mortaring it together, gluing it together, and then it's done, by having a refractory mortar, it can go back in the kiln. And I don't know that I have a ton of answers for what the opportunity is there, but I know that it's there. And, and through going through this process, we're gonna find more. Um, and the, these are again, our early studies. So one of the, the tougher parts of showing up and knowing I had to test the materials was essentially, once the decisions were made, hey, which materials are we working with? Then there's a little bit of a lead time just to get the, those materials in. Um, so then it's just playing in the in-between and just figuring out, you know, how, how things can go together. Um, and, and that's been one of the things for moving around the country is that every area of the country has a different uh, supplier or different materials. And even a company like Laguna has three separate sort of bases of operation being California, Ohio, and Florida. And even with that one company, there are sort of three different product lines just based on the materials that they get. And this is some more of that play, um, some brick, uh, like fire brick uh, cutoffs just being assembled into pots and just seeing how the materials take color and, and what surfaces might happen. Um, and then it's just nice. Um, I have to do a better job of, of getting images of sort of the, the whole studio, um, but this is sort of that first clay drop off um, from Laguna, um, which is just a, it was an absolutely huge order. Um, 
but it was great. And, and there was a bunch of other stuff that came. it wasn't just clay. I mean, it was paper fiber and um, the material that they make shelves and posts out of. Um, it was really open access to some products that they make and sell. And then some things that are only sort of available on the factory floor. Um, and then from there, it was just sort of getting into building and, and understanding the material. Um, this red clay um, is a really bricky red clay from Laguna. And I found that the advantage there was that it was it was a short material. It wanted to break and crumble a lot. And so you can see in, in here, um, the, those sort of broken edges were just, that, that was the opportunity with this material. Um, and there's a lot of this in between. So we'll, we'll eventually get to the object that this becomes, but all these little moments um, of figuring out the systems for everything. So even this is just how do I, once these are cut and get fired, how do I handle these? Um, so this is just in the bins um, in sort of a toss them in way or an ordered way. Um, And it, it just sort of changes the process of working. Um, because the, the process here is laborious, there's a lot of that in-between time. And so my experience of time is different when I'm sort of pulling from the container of the sort of loosely arranged parts versus the ordered parts. Um, and this is, I, I just, I made some uh, bisque molds just to sort of uh, lift up underneath. And then there's a little bit of paper just to prevent the refractory mortar in between um, from sticking to the ceramic support below. And this is the build out. Um, which is just, uh, you know, assembling into a vessel form. And it's, there, there are these nice moments that happen because as everything's building up, um, there's all these little micro decisions about how things come together. You, you can imagine a, an empirical cylinder shape, um, but when you place each little bit, the tiniest adjustment in that bit just affects sort of where that goes and, and what movement shows up. And then that becomes the finished object. Um, and, and there's this weird moment because I haven't made much with this since making this object because sometimes things sort of get answered or, or satisfied for the moment. And then it's you move on to something else. Um, and, and being sensitive to that momentum is really important to me because that's sort of how I make sure that I'm not getting stuck and I'm constantly moving forward is sometimes you just need to switch to another project. Um, and, and this is actually a process that I love, but I knew early on that I was really scared of getting stuck in a process. So every time that something feels like, okay, I've got this end of things figured out, that's where the shift has to happen. Um, and luckily enough, um, the studio does a lot of the soda firings. Um, so these outdoor kilns with adding the, the vapor glaze, um, and so even, even that just becomes a nice break of knowing, okay, here's a week to make a couple of pots. Um, and then even the, these projects of, um, you know, making some porcelain mugs. And then finding ways of letting my ways of, of working just come into, you know, even a simple project like the mug itself. Um, so this is just carving. A, a lot of carving. Little, little grouping of those together. And then again, it's just it's just paying attention. So this is sort of one of the more interesting moments that comes out is all these little carved bits from those cups, they accumulate. And then because they're sort of in the center, like this is the, the resulting thing. Um, and I I don't have a good way to hold on to it right now, but I know in the future that there, there's something that'll come out of that. Uh, the, and the, this actually, this idea kind of relates to uh, whether it's like investment casting, lost, lost casting, um, or, or even um, 
it's a similar appearance to, I was sanding a pot at one point and was just noticing the powders of pile, uh, sorry, piles of powder building up. And, and was just thinking through like that, that in itself is additive manufacturing. Um, that's th that's essentially 3D printing. And so at some point, there'll, there'll be a project that comes out of that. Um, and then this is just sort of getting into real clay work. Um, and you'll notice from the studio, uh, just being able to see like top and bottom that all the projects sort of happen, uh, not at one time, but it's it's just a little bit of juggling. And that juggling helps keep momentum. And again, another studio moment of pulling the, the clay forms off and just noticing like, oh, that that residue is is really interesting. Um, and then again with, with the samples, just sort of keeping some of those around and making new ones and, and just figuring out sort of how and what those become. And clay, clay is not without its problems. Um, you know, so this was, uh, it was rolling the cart outside to do some sanding and hit a bump and one piece becomes two. And, um, you know, that's sort of part of it. And the next thing to do is just sort of get building again. This is sort of properly sanded. Um, and another interesting thing that I found from moving around the country is that instead of um, trying to get every material to perform exactly as needed, I tend to lean towards materials that will just sort of work and get the job done. And then what I can do is apply surfaces that make the material essentially be what I want them to. Uh, they'll visually read as, as you know what I want them to be. Uh, but I don't have to have the problems of, of building with certain materials that just um, are a little bit more finicky or, or just tougher to work with. And then from here, it's just, I can't tell you how, how much problem solving just went into figuring out how to arc this building pattern around this curve. Um, Um, yeah, and then it's just getting towards building. And, and it's funny now to look back because even just the, clean, the cleanliness or lack of cleanliness in some of these early builds is apparent. And it's because of just uh, having to go through and figure out all the little tricks of, um, you know, how do I put the material into the, the syringe and how do I use the syringe? Um, do I need to tune the material? Um, or, or um, deflocculate it or, or just change the material in a way that allows it to flow better to clean things up. Um, but it's not something to worry about because those are just things that happen over time. Um, and, and that's sort of one of the, the strange things about it. I mean, that's, you take a beginner pottery class and you get into this moment of, of realizing, you know, hey, the, the, the pots that you make that are really um, sort of gross or uneasy or, um, you know, tough to love, you know, up front, you know, there's frustration because it's not coming out the way you want, but then you, you make those adjustments over time and, and all of a sudden you can't, you can't get the weird things to happen. Um, but there, I think there's just a comfort in knowing that th that technical progression will just naturally happen no matter what you're doing. There's no way to sort of unknow that. Um, and these are these are the resulting works. I, this image I like to show just because um, the funny thing about making pots is that the pots sort of hold the things as you go. And so I'm actually, it was just like pulling each piece out um, as it went. And th these are just some of the resulting bits. And, and then th this was also an interesting moment of recognizing one, there's a couple of firings going on, um, but two, that I naturally have this want to continue to surface or handle or, or, or do things. Um, I think that the repetition is sort of apparent in the work, um, uh, but I think, you know, just this patterning here was trying to figure out um, 
is there a way to sort of continue just a little bit? Um, and actually, the difference between these two pieces is just interesting um, because it's there's so much that's figured out sort of on the go um, intuitively. And, and that's sort of what opens the door to having possibilities. If, if I knew what was going to happen at each turn, um, one, it'd be far less interesting, but but two, it, it just... Uh, there's a lot of possibility that would be squandered. Um, so what I'm referring to is if you if you look at this piece and just see um, in this one that this this stack on top was already built, um, and I was just spraying over, and then on the next one I was able to have the foresight to spray the piece and then build on top, and and so that just it's another possibility. Um, then it was a funny moment of realizing that uh, you know as all the brick product as it comes in the store is sort of doing the same thing. Um, th this was an interesting moment too, of just um, wanting to sort of sculpt a little bit of drippy. Um, I've gotten a little bit better at sculpting the drips, um, but it, it's just this interesting moment of tr trying to figure out like the, the realness of the thing. And at the end of the day, the, I mean, the funny thing about some of this work is that the things that I respond to in like this piece are just some of the same stuff that's just in those brick stacks as, as they exist in the world. And yeah, and then, you know, it's getting right back into the clay and... At this point, I was starting to sort of ask, um, I wish I had times and dates and everything, but I was just starting to sort of wonder um, about the bases and, and using the bases um, or, or actually starting to think that maybe they just exist on their own. And then that, that sort of leads into this existential crisis of, uh, Okay, the stacking, and then the bases exist separately, and then it's it's sort of this moment of of recognizing like oh that the pieces actually look really nice when they're sort of partially finished, um, which is a really big crisis to start to question like do I need to fully execute every little bit, and and that was one of the big moments um, from from that that purple piece with the sort of larger build out of of recognizing like okay when when everything's stacked up, great it's stacked. But maybe the points that are most interesting is when it's not fully stacked. Um, and then it was another moment of just kind of questioning, like once a stack is there, like what's another, is there a way to sort of restack or stack more? And, that, and that's sort of a uh, Paulus packing principle. Um, so that classic engineer example of, of talking through you know, if you have a beach bucket and you fill the beach bucket with grapefruits, um, you know, it can be full of grapefruits. But then if you have ping pong balls, you can insert ping pong balls into the spaces in between. And then it's full again until you have chickpeas. And then you fill those into all the spaces. And it's still full, but you can still then go back in and, and add sand to the mix. Again, just taking notice of these moments. And then, uh, you know, again, to deal with that existential crisis of what if the bases don't need anything built, the only answer is just to get in and just sort of work through it, make stuff and, and respond to it. Um, so this is a build out, um, you know, and it, it's working on multiple pieces at one time just so that there's no downtime. Um, and the funny thing about it is pinching and squishing clay is just, it's really simple and easy and direct. And some of the, the solutions, you know, it's propping up clay with other clay. Um, or in this instance, anything that's around. 
Um, and, and one of the really nice things was that all of these forms back up are being built upside down. Um, and, and that sort of changed the logic of everything because essentially I spent a lot of time where I was like having to tilt my head and sort of look and try and see. Um, but the relationship to form is really different because I couldn't get an immediate sense of what we were looking at. And, and that was sort of a big moment too, in, in terms of just finding forms that were not what I'd expect or design. And then again, just trying to find. Um, so with that interest in additive manufacturing and 3D printing and, and repetitive you know, tasking, um, just sort of drilling and opening up the forms was just another way to sort of continue to go through the process. And, and once these are drilled, they then started, I, I could fill them um, with fresh clay. And, and that just sort of made something else. As it were. And, and then while that's, while that's going on, um, just constantly testing and just trying to find like, okay, now that, now that these are going to be objects, what, how do they exist, right? The, the surfacing is always um, the toughest part. Uh, when I'm teaching classes, um, which has been, you know, really great since uh, January when I'm out to reopen classes here, um, you know, but, but I'll talk about glazing as, as the last chance to ruin your work. Um, and it kind of is because it, there's these moments where you can fracture objects and, and end up with objects that just, um, you know, aren't convincing. So it, it becomes a real sort of moment of trying to figure out, you know, what are these, what do these objects get when they look like this, you know, they're, they're sort of a blank. Um, and so the, this was some of the solution that I started to find to that. And one of the most exciting parts was when I first started to photograph these, um, I took a studio image and I was finding the iPhone was having trouble focusing on the surface. Um, and this matte slip that I developed here just does a really great job of just eating the light and allowing the form to really be seen. And as always, it's just right back to the, the testing and making use of that little test kiln. Um, and, and the result of that is just this sort of pile of, of stuff that they're little kernels. And whenever I feel the momentum start to slow, there's always a little solution or something to work on. And, and I think that that problem solving is really important um, because it, it becomes permission to not have answers. Um, but if, if there's always sort of questions queued up, there's always something to sort of drive at. And that's good. So one of these projects was um, this here, um, which is uh, a mix of plaster and clay. And I had spent uh, about three years uh, working in a glass casting studio where plaster silica is used uh, to create molds that are then fired. And those fired molds um, are essentially disposable. Once they're fired, the plaster is calcined and it's no good. So these tests were aimed at trying to find a way to essentially build quickly with plaster and then have enough ceramic material in there that it can then be fired and just become a ceramic object. This is just sort of a nice residue moment because the residue of the plaster clay is also different. Um, you know, it has a working time of maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and then that material is set, but it still has clay in it. And that's really strange to deal with clay that is both set and still wet. Um, and the funny part about it was using clay as molds. Um, and really what I'm after, um, there'll, there'll be more of this, but just the, the immediacy of being able to take the material and sloth it across, uh, across a form 
and then it sets, you know, within 15 to 30 minutes and then it's an object um, and it, it gets fired and goes through the ceramic process, but, but it's really sort of complete at that moment. And it, it allows all the gesture and everything just to be frozen. Um, and th this was another attempt at just seeing um, a number of these of just trying to make mold portions. Um, so this is thrown clay that the plaster clay gets added to. And, you know, it's just trying to find, can I make, you know, a vessel in a, a 10 minute, you know, span? And can I capture all that? And, and the trouble is still figuring out the material because even though the material exists doesn't mean that we, you know, it does what we want it to do. Um, so in here, and, and you can just see this, this piece is just falling apart. And the answer remedy to, uh, remedy to that is just trying more stuff. Um, so adding in um, cement or, or refractory uh, cement or um, changing the ratio of materials and each, each material added or taken away or, or done with, you know, is just another, it's another opportunity. And then again, paying attention. One of the most beautiful things was finding this here is, you know, one of the um, probably clay or, or refractory mortar in the plaster. And it, it grabbed onto the, um, the clay mold in a very interesting way where that sort of, I would be fine if the sort of clay imprints became the, the final object. Um, and again, you know, more, more falling apart but that's okay because it's sort of zeroing in on something. And a couple of these samples, especially on the upper left here, um, are really interesting in terms of the weight. Some of them are heavy and they're shrinking a lot as much as 20 or 30%. Um, and then some of them are light and eerie and not shrinking at all, just depending on how refractory they are. And they, those are like, um, they almost feel like styrofoam. Um, but the real idea is just to be able to create immediate form, be able to sort of wave your hand in space, and then that is the object. And this is really interesting too, just being able to sort of glaze up or, or re-wet the plaster clay material, but it doesn't matter because it's got the plaster holding it there together. And again, more, more falling apart. It's kind of, that's our MO. Um, and then, you know, again, just finding momentum is really important. And, you know, so I'll always go back to making pots in those moments where it's like, okay, things have fallen apart too much. And then once we feel comfortable again, it's going back in and figuring out. Um, What's next? And the idea here is it's not entirely uh, sequential in terms of a lot of breaks are being taken, but the hope is that there's just this linear building up the same way that an architect would have models. Um, and that would just sort of create, and this was an interesting moment too, of finding that I could start to mask off this material. And then that, that changes the, the sort of language of what these are because it sort of integrates the material and also gives this unveiling effect to the work. And that this is an entire kiln load worth of those. So that, that's, it's about 12,000 um, of these little sticks to then build up. And then again, little things, it's just paying attention and figuring out, oh, I, sh I shouldn't be sort of slathering on a single line, but it should be beaded just the way it is up top. And then also just recognizing the moments of play in between. Some of the reason I keep all the objects around is that we can just find new, new things. And this doesn't become the finished object, but it sort of lends to something happening. And this is some of that finished work. One of the biggest things is the curves always prevented the light from traveling through these structures just because it was a lot tighter on the inside. 
But this is sort of a dense uh, view. And then just with turning the work, it opens up and it changes the weight just based on how you're looking at the form. And that, that was a really interesting moment to realize. You know, so again, tight from this view and then loosen up and And again, just trying to take note and just pay attention to all this. Um, and, and this is a sprayed surface where you can see the beaded material start small, but start to develop into a larger um, sort of macro texture. And again, once that work's completed, it's right back into testing again. And these, these were all the tests that were aimed at um, finding almost a snow-like material so that I can, I can sort of coat um, the material in, in maybe like a half inch or inch thick of, of outer material. But the problem with the ceramic materials is that they constantly, they wanna crack and fall apart. Um, and again, clay tests, just seeing if we can get this, the same to happen. And everything sort of happens in the detail. It's, it's tough to find like the kernel of this that's really important, but it's those moments where the material starts to foam. And the, the idea here is that the material can expand. Um, and so that's, uh, it was, it ended up being the tricalcium phosphate, um, which is sort of like a, a synthetic uh, bone ash um, that at low temperature will start to create, um, it almost looks like fake snow, like you'd expect on like a, um, a diorama. Um, and that expansion is important because it, it, it would change the game of how the mortar and the coverings would work. You know, so it's just trying to get those tested and then also working through and just trying to figure out what's, what's the opportunity. How does it get used? Is it uh, dry to dry, uh, green, like green to green? Is it bisque to bisque? Um, you know, how does this material get used? Paper fiber, uh, sugar changes how the, both the clay and, and the moisture moves through everything. Um, and so this was a nice moment just where the mold making classes were starting to inform some of what's going on. Um, all right. And then again, some of the cutouts. All right, and the, these are actually what's in progress right now. And um, if you remember in part A, uh, the sort of first talk, one of the things that was mentioned was this sort of pizza oven. And so I, I took a quick interlude. I'll, I'll run through this uh, on the quicker side, uh, but this is the build out that's going on right now. Um, and so essentially the, the studio had a bunch of uh, brick around. And I didn't get a pile of the, or a picture of the pile beforehand, but this is all the mortar chipped off and then every brick gets ground. And then that's sort of the raw material that then goes into the kiln. Um, and this is just a drawing to help figure out all the angles as everything moves in. Because the angles on the dome are, are compounded, um, the angles have to sort of change as everything goes up the arch. Um, you know, so it's important just to be getting everything cut and fit and into place. And it looks like a lot of complicated math, but it's just sort of marking it up and, and sort of cutting as you go. And one of the big things is that a lot of pizza ovens uh, struggle to get hot quickly. Um, a lot of designs that you see. And so the, one of the big important things here was one, um, making a lot of holes so that we can get this thing hot. We can just sort of fire it like a blowtorch, get a lot of air in there and then seal it off later. And two, to have a shelf so that we can just push coals off and keep that hearth ready to go. Um, and this is some of that methodology where these cutouts, so I can draw out on copy paper, transfer to a tar paper, and then that tar paper can go right onto the bricks to do the cuts that are needed to get into place. 
And that's a lot of the scrap that happens from all those cuts. And then everything is just dry fit. And once it's dry fit, that's when it needs to get mortared together. And so this has kind of been a fun process um, working with Nate at the studio to, to get these, you know, these bricks put together. And we sort of learned a bit up front. Again, the arch form. And I'm a big fan of just doing things the simplest, most direct way. Um, so this is an arch form made out of cardboard, you know, so it's just enough to hold everything in place. But once, you know, once the arch is set, you can just pull the cardboard out and it's fine. It's there. This is Sammy, one of our helpers. And this is how the oven sits now. So we have to go in and finish that up. And this is current state of the studio. And yeah, that, that's all. Um, so that, that's been the year. Um, I definitely want to give a thanks to God, all, all of the Amoka staff and um, just the, the community here for being really great. Um, I did not have a ton of pictures of the soda firings and the sushi. And eventually there'll be pizza. Um, uh, but yeah, all you guys and, and Laguna, um, uh, God Wingate and, and everyone, uh, it's been really great and got another month here to sort of finish out and make it happen. Great. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you, Colby, uh, so much. Uh, we have some time for questions, so feel free to either type your questions out in the chat, uh, or use a little raised hand emoji and then we can have you ask them. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Hey Dara. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dara just commented about um, the mix of materials and building techniques and styles and, and that shift of like hard to soft. And um, yeah, I think that's been one of the constants in, in clay is just that ability for clay to be anything. Um, and it just sort of, there's no way to get bored of it because it's constantly able to do something else or act like something else or be something else. Um, and it's really exciting to find the squish of clay um, but it, um, it can do a lot more too. So I want to find those things. So it looks like, Jed. oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So Joe, Joe had mentioned, um, or, or said that I mentioned, I, I had a plan when I started the residency. Um, so she's asking what the plan was and if I deviated or met the goals and, and what that was. Um, and so when I pulled up that slide that was of that one brick sample, um, I, I guess what I would say is that I look at that, that single object as a plan and that the plan is just to interrogate the brick lattice structure. Um, and, and there's there's this history of brick being used in interesting ways architecturally um, to both create space or, or, um, or let light in or block light out or, or divide space. And there's no upper limit to what the goal is or, or what things become. And so it's nice in that the goal is always met, right? So as long as we're investigating, it's like, you know, mission accomplished. Um, but I, I always want the opportunity to be open for the work to continue to scale up and sort of become something else. Um, and it, it's intimidating to think of on an architectural scale. I mean, I've worked on uh, a Nina Hole project, which is, you know, the 6,000 pounds of clay and the, the 12 feet tall month long project. Um, and, and even that, I mean, that's an incredibly uh, intense experience and, and just a huge object. Um, but even that feels like there might be a point down the road where that's small in some ways, or, or there's more opportunity. Um, but 
you're always constantly fighting to sort of do what you can within your means. And so I don't have full access to an architectural tile company right now or an architectural building company. But maybe at some point down the line, something happens where a project can come out of that and that can drive forward. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the residency plan was sort of open-ended investigation of that and it's happened, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, Beth Ann just asking about being in Southern California and how that's affected things. Um, I think I'm trying to figure some of that out. I mean, some, some of the simple things, um, we had done a couple of um, factory tours at Laguna, right? And sort of getting back into that factory space, I have some experience doing factory work um, from the pandemic, um, but sort of re-entering that and just seeing, uh, so like the, the shelves are slip cast there. So it's literally like 24 by 24 inch shelves that are being slip cast. Um, and they're in gang molds, which are literally, I don't know, 15 or 20 long. And there are workers that are just lifting those shelves out and flopping them around, which from a clay perspective is just like, it doesn't make sense that that would work, that the shelves would be flat, that the material would be okay, that the slip casting would work. Um, you know, so that's been, that's been one component, just being able to get out and see that. Um, the LA galleries have been sort of mind blowing. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, it's, you can be outdoors sort of every day of the year here, but then it's also different that, you know, some of the heat, there's days where it's just like, it's a good, you know, time to do computer work between like two and four o'clock when the sun is just absurd. Um, and then, and then, of course, just the shape of everything is so different. Being on the, the East Coast, all of our hills are sort of their little mounds. Um, but in Pomona, you're you're in this valley, and the mountains are like a brick wall behind everything, and they never go away. You'll you'll be driving on the road, and there'll be a Seven Eleven, and then twice the height of the Seven Eleven visually, the mountains are just right there at all times. And it's especially crazy in the winter you look out and there's palm trees and there's sun, but there's also snow capped mountains. And that's just like a, a, a weird sort of hard to compute moment. Um, but all of that, yeah, it just, it appears there. And um, uh, trying to, so yeah, I'm seeing from uh, uh, Polly here, um, getting asked about influence, um, uh, of natural shapes um, and talking about the series and generation of forms. I mean, that, that's where that generation of forms, you know, sort of come from. Um, and, and that's some of, you know, working intuitively is that things will, will naturally happen. Your brain is going to naturally process things. And, and I don't feel the need to get too caught up in, in being prescriptive about what things need to be or what need, what needs to happen. Um, and some of that comes from just that background as a potter, right? Some of it is just moving through material, moving through clay and understanding that through iteration, things will happen. Um, yep, and yep, and Shelly uh, asking about future plans. Um, I mean, it's, you know, again, I'm here uh, still in residence for another month. Um, and it's amazing what happens, uh, you know, in the last sort of month in a place it's for everyone. Um, you'll see someone, you know, and you'll know they're going to the last month and then it just like things happen at that time. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm going to continue sort of doing residencies and, and traveling and, and using the resources to find new things in the work. Um, and it's a little bit loose, but I'm becoming more comfortable with that. I mean, I'm really someone who needs to know ahead of time what's going to happen and how things are going to work. But, you know, after so many years of this, I've been traveling for residencies for maybe six or seven years now. Um, there's a moment of just understanding that 
everything will work out. And so that's a little bit freeing, right? That That's a moment to just allow things to happen without worry. And we're, we're getting there. The last minute questions. Let's see. Nobody's got their hand raised. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, and for your excellent questions. Uh, for more of Colby's work, you can visit his website, which is dropped into the chat right there. Uh, if you're in the neighborhood, come on down to the museum uh, and the studio in Pomona. You can learn more about Amoca, our ceramic studio and artisan resident program, and our current exhibitions at our mm -hmm. website, amoca.org. Also in the chat right there, a uh, recording of this presentation will be available uh, on Amoca's website in the coming weeks. So thanks again, and hope to see you all soon. Mm -hmm.